Well, good morning, everyone. So um, I'm going to be speaking from John chapter 10. You might like to open in your Bibles if you have them. And while you're finding that, I'll just tell you a little story. I grew up in the country. We weren't real farmers. We were pretend farmers. But we still, we had a few sheep and a few cows and a few horses. And uh, our sheep were extraordinary. I have not known sheep like that before or since. They were almost like goats, the way they could get out of anywhere. So we would put them in one paddock and they would find the smallest of holes and wriggle their way through and they would be in whatever paddock they liked to be in. Now when it came to shearing time, because we were just small time of course, we didn't have a shearing shed, and there are a few other people like us, so what would happen was that all the flocks would be taken to the real farmer's place who had the shearing shed. And they'd all be in there, supposedly, in their pens, waiting for the shearers. So um, actually, my dad had, had left by this stage. So a neighboring farmer by the name of Frank, he helped us. He often helped us. And he took our sheep about two kilometers up the road to the, the the sheep farmer's place. This was the night before, and he put them in the pen, and they were there with all the other flocks, all in their separate pens. And in the morning, you know what's going to happen to you. This flock is in its pen, and this flock is in its pen. And our flock, they're off in the paddock somewhere, having a lovely time. Anyway, they were retrieved, and they were shorn. And Frank thought, I don't need to take these sheep back again, they can find their own way. So he just opened the farmer's gate, drove down, opened our gate, and sure enough, about an hour later, our sheep returned and I shut the gate behind them. So I'll come back to those sheep. But let us begin. Now I've got to the sad old age where I have to wear these. John chapter 10, starting from verse 1. I assure you, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. For a shepherd enters through the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they recognize his voice. They won't follow a stranger, they will run away from him because they don't recognize his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I assure you, I am the gate for the sheep. All others who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes. I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Wherever they go, they will find green pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will leave the sheep because they aren't his and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he is merely hired and has no real concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I lay down my life, that I may have it back again. No one can take my life from me. I lay my life down voluntarily, for I have the right to lay it down when I want, and also the power to take it again, for my Father has given me this command. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinions about him. Some of them said, he is a demon or he's crazy. Why listen to a man like that? Others said, 
This doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of a blind? Which is what happened in chapter 9. It was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah. He was at the temple walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. The Jewish leaders surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have already told you, and you don't believe me. A proof is what I do in the name of my Father. But you don't believe me because you are not part of my flock. My sheep recognize my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. So no one can snatch them away from me. The Father and I are one. Once again, the Jewish leaders picked up stones to kill him. And I'm going to leave it there. The village sheepfold. So John is a, a book full of imagery. And Jesus begins here, the village sheepfold. All his listeners would have been able to picture this very clearly. So just like um, with the sheep farmer, that I was telling you about, all the flocks would gather. There actually would have been a number of different flocks gathered in this one sheepfold. And there was a gate, and there was a gatekeeper. Now, I've got a theme that you will see. So the gate is in red, the shepherd, Jesus, is in green, and the sheep, who are us, are in blue. Now, what I want you to recognise from, or notice from this passage, is that the shepherd calls his own. So he comes, he would call them by name, and they would follow him. And the repetition of the sheep, that they would recognise his voice. Further down in verse 4, they would know his voice. They wouldn't follow a stranger because they did not know his voice. So there's assurance in this passage that when the shepherd calls us, we will in fact know his voice. Now... Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. Now, I'm just working with the image here, so I'm thinking of a lot of sheep feeling pretty confused, not quite sure who to follow. So Jesus explains it to them a bit more. But to our ears, it actually makes it a little bit more confusing for a moment because a moment ago he was the shepherd and now he says he is the gate. Uh, there's that... I am the gate. So you know that John has uh, seven of these famous I am statements. This is one of them. I am the gate. Um, and that is repeated. Yes, I am the gate. All right. Now, the reason that Jesus is both the shepherd and the gate, and I know this is a favorite from Sunday school, Again, the people who were listening to him, this is what they would have known immediately when he was talking. Oh, we're no longer in the village sheepfold. In fact, we are in an outlying sheepfold. And the practice was that the shepherd would lead the flock out into the pasture. And in summertime, they would often stay out there overnight and they would leave the sheep in these outlying sheepfolds. As you can see, it has no gate. The shepherd would lie down at night across the gateway. So again, that would have made perfect sense to them. Now, that probably looks really crowded, and I apologise for that, but what I'm wanting you to notice is the repetition. So again, we have another I am statement. It starts off with, I am the good shepherd. And then he says... The good shepherd lays down his life. It's almost by definition that the good shepherd is the one who lays down his life, effectively the one who lays down his life in that gap that we saw before between safety and danger. And this is contrasted with what the hired hand does. 
You see in the purple, that repetition again. The hired hand will run away. The hired hand will abandon the sheep. The hired hand runs away because he doesn't care about the sheep. And the um, wolf comes and the flock is scattered. So let me, I want to tell you about my own flock again, back to my sheep, who seemed to think they didn't need a shepherd. Anyway, one morning I got up and I went out probably to tend to the horses before going to school and I noticed that something was wrong with the sheep. They were, no other word to describe it, they were scattered. Sheep don't scatter. Obviously something had happened. You know, there was uh, a couple hiding behind the tank stand, you know, another group over here, another group over there. It was even two, it was an irrigation property, another two had got themselves in the um, irrigation channel and because they were waterlogged and heavy, they couldn't get out, so I had to help them out. Clearly something had happened. So anyway, off to school, night time. Next morning I get up, same thing again, the sheep are scattered. Something has obviously come in and has been disturbing them. This went on for some time. And finally, you know, well, it got to the point where I would sleep like really lightly. And as soon as I would hear them cry, I'd be out there trying to find out what it was and trying to, trying to protect them. And finally, uh, it was discovered that it was in fact the, the neighbor's dog, another neighbor. And he agreed to chain the dog, so the problem was solved. He chained the dog up at night time. So my sheep, who um, had initially uh, seemed not to need a shepherd, they in fact needed a good shepherd. I like to think I wasn't a bad shepherd. I didn't abandon them, but I was pretty mediocre. Let's put it that way. I wasn't out there laying down my life on the line. Okay, let's go back to this repetition of lays down my life, lay down my life. So it starts off, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 15, so I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, I lay down my life. Verse 18, I lay it down voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to. Five times. We were saying before, John is full of imagery. And another image that that John is fond of is Jesus as the Passover lamb. And I think there is a merging here of two images. So we have, as we saw before, the shepherd laying down in that gap between safety and danger, but we also have this sense of foreboding that Jesus is not just the shepherd, he is also the Passover lamb who will sacrifice his life, lay down his life. And I have bolded the Father. I want just to introduce the sense of the Father there. The Father knows me and I know the Father. The Father loves me basically because I'm obedient to the Father. The people were again confused, not sure what's going on, not sure which shepherd, so to speak, to follow. Some said he's demon-possessed and out of his mind. Others said, no, he's not. He doesn't sound like a man demon-possessed. Now, there is a section break, and it is a different time. The section we have just been in was Jesus in Jerusalem for the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, and then now, a month later, he's back in Jerusalem, or possibly still in Jerusalem, for Hanukkah. So it is a different time, and that's why there's a section break there, but I'm happily putting the two sections together because the subject material is in fact really similar, and I think they are related. Now, I'm sorry this is a bison and not a sheep. I really wanted it to be a sheep, but I couldn't find a full, a proper photo. So when I was talking before about this merging of images, Jesus is both the shepherd and the sacrificial lamb, throughout John you'll find this, this build up of animosity and a menace towards Jesus coming from the Jewish leaders. And when I read these words, the Jewish leaders surrounded him. I'm like, that to me was a, a further sense of foreboding. Um, and those questions, they're not 
idle curiosity questions. They are questions seeking to trap him. And this is Jesus' reply. The proof is the work I do in my Father's name. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. It's like a summary of that first picture. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. Sorry, I've already read that. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Again, I wanted you to note the repetition. No one can snatch them away from me. And you think about the relationship with the Father that in this picture here. Previously, we talked about uh, Jesus. the shepherd knows the Father, and the shepherd is obedient to the Father. But here, there is a drawing closer much closer. I and the Father are one. And as the, as the shepherd has drawn close to the Father, the shepherd has also drawn the sheep close to the Father. And the sheepfold is now the Father's hand. And I ended with this verse. Once again, the Jewish leaders picked up stones to kill him. So you can see that the, the sense of menace has in fact turned to a direct threat. Now, I've taken you through this passage twice, and you possibly think that's enough, but the reason I wanted to do that was to make sure that you were really familiar, you had it very um, clear in your head, so that we can now embark on the journey that I think John is in fact inviting us on. The Bible often talks about life as a journey. You remember the the exodus, you know, the Israelites being taken from slavery, walking through the wilderness to the promised land. The writer to the Hebrews, talking about in chapter 11 of the the men and women of faith, how they saw themselves as aliens and foreigners who were just passing through and that they were looking for a heavenly home. And that image of the, the journey is often of great comfort to me. You know, life is not all green pastures and still waters. Sometimes it gets very difficult and it feels like a burden. And in those times, to be able to remind myself, it's just a journey and we're just passing through. We are aliens and strangers on our way to the promised land. I find that of enormous comfort. And uh, to me... John here in chapter 10 is painting a journey and I find it particularly comforting because it is really, really simple. It's not simple for the shepherd. For the shepherd it is painful and dangerous and and very difficult. But for for the sheep, it's perfectly simple and there are no tricks involved. So one more time, let's go on this journey. So we started out in the village sheepfold This is a safe place, but it's really busy and it's really noisy. There are lots of distractions and lots of other voices calling. Often my life feels like this, my every day. You go off to work, you look after the kids, you do the house. There's all kinds of busy things. It's safe, it's easy enough, but there's few opportunities for growth. And there are many other voices calling for my allegiance and other distractions. There are other shepherds calling. And our job here is to listen. I think it's very pertinent to note that about the shepherd, that the shepherd doesn't sneak and the shepherd doesn't steal. He calls. Now, the problem with that from the perspective of sheep is that we cannot be passive. No one's going to make up our minds for us. No one's going to rip us out of there. We have to listen and we have to decide to follow when the shepherd calls. But you will remember the repetition in that first passage. We will know, we will know, we will know the shepherd's voice. It's not a trick. 
Okay, so we have listened to the shepherd, and the shepherd has called us out into pasture. This is a great place for growth. There are good opportunities out here. But there's no gate, and there's no gatekeeper, so it's more dangerous. There are no other sheep. There's only one shepherd and one flock, so it's quiet. We don't have the same distractions. But the thing is, we are solely dependent upon our shepherd for our survival. And our job is to trust that the shepherd, who by definition is good, is laying down his life for us in that gap between danger and safety. I was thinking about, oh, what would be an example from my life? I think, you know, standing up and preaching is a simple example. It's a bit dangerous, but um, lots of opportunities for growth. Um, But then I'll tell you another story. We went with Michael, my husband Michael's work in 2010 to India, and I just found India the most incredibly difficult and stressful place for various reasons. Uh, and I did have a lot of fears there, and I felt like I was disappearing into myself. And one day I was praying and reading the Bible, and I read this passage from... Exodus chapter 14, this is just as the, um, you know, the Israelites have just escaped from Egypt and the army, Pharaoh's army, is catching up with them. And so they are completely terrified. Uh, Verse 13. So they're watching, the Israelites are watching the army approaching. But Moses told the people... Don't be afraid. Just stand where you are and watch the Lord rescue you. The Egyptians you see today, or as I interpret it for myself in India, what I'm fearing today, I will never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. You won't have to lift a finger in your defence. Quite similar to John, really. The shepherd is going to fight for the sheep. And then... uh, So that was 2010. 2011, um, we were transferred to China, and I knew this was the shepherd calling me out. I had no problems with that. And we moved to this wonderful city called Shaman, which was just like living probably in downtown Melbourne. It's relatively safe, pretty easy. It was very easy. We lived in an apartment that had heating and cooling, And there were foreigners everywhere. If I didn't want to speak uh, Chinese or learn English, I really, uh, I knew, I do know English. If I didn't, um, if I didn't want to learn Chinese, I could still get by. And we went to a foreigner's church and I went to a, um, a, a foreign women's Bible study and I had foreign friends and the girl's piano teacher spoke really good English and all these sorts of things. It was easy. And I had all these networks set up. And then after six months, Michael's company wanted him to shift to this other city. And I'm like, well, is this the voice of the shepherd calling me? Because if it is, fine. But if it's not, it was going to be hugely difficult. There would be very little English spoken. There would be very few foreigners. I would have to start making networks, making friends again. And scary of scary, I was probably going to have to make friends with Chinese people um, and learn Chinese. So I was praying about this as to whether I really had to do it. And one of the women from this international church, who I didn't know very well and had barely spoken to, she came and she said, I've got a verse for you. And it was, of course, this same verse that the Lord had given me in India from Exodus. Don't be afraid. Just stand where you are and watch the Lord rescue you. The fears that you have, you'll never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. You won't have to lift a finger. I was like, cool. All right. 
So the shepherd is calling me out. And I was so grateful for that because then when the Lord led me into that outlying sheepfold where there were huge opportunities for growth, I could trust him that the good shepherd was there to lay down his life in that gap between safety and danger. <clears throat> now, finally, the shepherd leads us so far, he leads us to the Father's hand. Now, John, I think, is often a little bit... He blurs the line as to whether he means this life or our eternal hope. And I suspect that maybe that blurring is because he means both. But ultimately... Our hope is that eternal home. And our final destination is where the sheepfold is the Father's hand. There are no dangers and no distractions. And remember that beautiful repetition. Once we're in the Father's hand, no one can snatch us away. No one can snatch us away. Let me pray for us. Father, we just thank you for that promise. We thank you that, that it's not a trick. We will know your voice when you call us. We thank you that you lead us on this journey and that you are utterly faithful and that you will lay down your life for us in that gap between safety and danger. And Father, we look forward to that time when the sheepfold is your hands and we can rest there. Amen. Amen.